Absolutely. My message today is entitled, The God Who Cares. And I want to start from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And church, I know we always put the scripture on the screen, but I really want to encourage you to be people who bring your Bible to church. I want you to read it in your Bible as well. I want you to have note paper and take notes, not because I'm a phenomenal preacher, but because the Word of God is powerful. And uh, we need to make notation about God's word. Listen, you're out there seven days a week, 24-7, hearing negative viewpoints from worldly people and from social media and from the media. You need to make more of a deal about getting the word of God into your spirit. This is what will give us life. The stuff we hear out there will drain us of life. It'll make us doubt. It'll make us afraid. It'll cause us to cringe. But the word of God causes us to rise up and take action. This is the bread of life. Can I get agreement? The word of God is the bread of life. You are what you eat. If you're not eating the word of God, you're weak. All right? All right. The God who cares. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, or at least we're going to start with verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, a harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the field. Now we just read several statements, a lot of information actually. Jesus went to the towns and the villages Jesus went to the synagogues. Jesus healed every disease and sickness. Uh, Jesus uh, preached the kingdom of God. And then we see that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. When did he see the crowds? I know the first verse says he went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming good news of the kingdom and healing every sick and every disease and every sickness, verse 36 says, when he saw the crowds, when did he see the crowds? He saw the crowds when he went to the first town. He saw the crowds when he went to the first village. A crowd doesn't have to be 10,000 people. A crowd is right here. A crowd is right here. What I'm saying is this. He didn't go from town to village to synagogue he didn't heal the sick, and then he saw a crowd, and he was moved with compassion. No. Jesus was moved with compassion the moment he saw people. When he went to the first town, there was a crowd, and he was moved with compassion. When he went to the first village, he saw the crowd. He was moved with compassion. When he stood in the synagogue, just like I'm standing here in the church, he saw the crowd, and he was moved with compassion, and he healed every disease. My point is this. Jesus didn't heal because he can. Jesus healed because he cares. Hello? He saw the crowd and had compassion on them because they were harassed, because they were helpless, because they were victimized, because they were broken, because they were hurting, because they were needs. And he's moved with compassion. And what really boggles my mind is that not only does he see people harassed and helpless, and he's moved with compassion, but then he says they were like sheep without a shepherd. What does harassed, helpless, tormented have to do with sheep without shepherds? You know what the Bible is saying? Israel was full of 
Levites. Israel was full of Pharisees. It was full of Sadducees. There were religious teachers on every corner just about. There was no shortage of religious teachers showing up. And yet Jesus is looking at the people and they're beat up, they're wounded, they're victimized, they're living less than... And Jesus comes to interrupt their lives and change their status of living, whether it was mental sickness or emotional sickness or physical sickness, Jesus came to change it. And he sees the people as if they're sheep without a shepherd. They had teachers galore. Here's the problem. Teaching religion and teaching the law isn't the same as teaching principles that will set you free. You see, you could teach the law of God without the love of God, and the Bible says the law of God without the love of God will kill. But the law of God with the heart of God brings life. And so the Pharisees were teaching religion for the sake of religion. They were teaching everything you shouldn't do and everything you should do. And the list of what you should do was over a thousand pages and the list of what you shouldn't do was over a thousand pages. In fact, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you guys aren't entering the kingdom of heaven and what's worse is that by your teaching, you are creating obstacles so that others can't enter the kingdom of heaven either. You see, here was God's people living in misery, and that was never God's plan. We have churches filled with people that have heard religious teaching and living in misery not even sure that God would heal them today, that God would listen to their prayer, that God even cares about their misery. And if Jesus was here today, he would make the same statement. He would be moved with compassion because the church is filled with people who know the gospel, but they don't know the God of the gospel. And they don't know that that God cares. God cares. He cares about your life. He cares about who you are. He cares about how you're doing. He wants to get personal with you. He wants to get into your life. He wants to break the shame. He wants to break the addiction. He wants to set you free. He wants to take that inferiority complex off of you. He wants to beat up that spirit of depression, that devil who keeps telling you you're useless, you're useless, that demon who keeps bringing you back to a moment in time in your childhood where you were wounded. Come on, for this reason was the Son of God made manifest on the earth to destroy the works of the evil one. That's Bible. The Bible says it. Jesus came to mess up everything that the devil was doing and to set people free. He was moved with compassion. That's why he went from village to village. He saw these are God's people and they're living in misery. They don't understand they're meant to be the head, not the tail. This is Israel. They're supposed to be living in a land of abundance. They're supposed to be living with life flowing through them. God had promised in the Old Testament, and I'll show you in a moment. He says, no disease will come upon you. And here are the people, they haven't been led by spiritual leaders. They've been led by selfish, carnal, manipulating leaders who were teaching religion instead of teaching the promises and the blessings of God. The context of everything I just read, he went from village, from town to village to synagogue, he healed every disease and every sickness. He taught the kingdom of God. He's moved with compassion. He did all of this. The context of everything is that he was moved with compassion. Everyone look at me. 
God loves you more than you will ever understand. And when you hurt, he hurts more. You know why? He's a God who cares. He calls himself a father, not because it's a religious title. He calls himself a father because a father who isn't broken is a father who's meant to protect and keep safe. A father, God created men to be protectors, and the devil warped men to be victimizers. But a man, a father, is meant to be a protector, a provider. And your father in heaven is a good protector and a good provider. He cares. Turn to somebody and say, God cares. No, now turn to somebody else and say, God cares about me. Now turn to that person again and say, and God cares about you. More than you know, more than you understand. You know, just like the Pharisees, just like the Sadducees, today we've made Christianity a religious institution and we talk more about sin and what to not do and what to do and uh, how we need to deal with sin. God wants to show you how much he loves you. Do you know sin's not as much of an issue when we understand how much God loves us and how much God is for us? And how much God wants to work in us and through us. We've done exactly what the Pharisees and the Sadducees have done. And we've taken the great news of the kingdom of God. And we've reduced it to a bunch of do's and don'ts. Rather than introducing people to the face and the character and the heart of God. Can I get an amen? Everything I just read, the context of it is the fact that God was moved with compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion, and so he went from town to village to synagogue. He healed everyone that was sick. And then he turned to his disciples and he said, see this compassion? See how helpless the people are? See how... They look like sheep without a shepherd. They haven't had teachers who have told them who they are. They haven't had teachers who would speak into them and say, come on, God doesn't want you to be down. God doesn't want you to be full of arthritis. Not that you are. I rebuke that. God doesn't want you to be in poverty. God doesn't want... No, no. The Pharisees would say things like, well, you're probably in sin and you broke the law and blah, 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 blah. And they created such a negative picture of God. Let me show you the picture that God paints of himself. In Exodus chapter 23, guys, I've skipped a couple of scriptures. Let's go down to Exodus chapter 23. In Exodus 23, verse 25 to 26, this is what God says. Worship the Lord your God. And his blessing will be on your food and your water. Stop. Before we read anything else, God even wants to bless your food and your water. And I don't mean bless like, you know, we pray before a meal and say, Father, bless the food, blah, 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 blah. And we go through the formality of it. No, God is writing this. And God is saying, I so want to be in your space. I so want to be in your life. I so want to have positive influence over you. I am so much for you and on your side that if you worship me, I will command a blessing even on the food you eat and the water you drink. I mean, that's almost like even the food, even the water, it's like God's taking the littlest thing and saying, yeah, I even want to saturate that aspect of your life. I mean, you think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. But let me tell you something. I think that carries more weight today than it did even back then. Because today, the food we eat is full of preservatives, it's full of food coloring, it's full of uh, antibiotics and growth hormones, et cetera, et cetera. The water we drink, there's fallout from the atmosphere. 
And people get panicky about what we eat. And I will say, where you can, eat well and eat healthy. But where you can't, God said, he's going to bless my food and he's going to bless my water. Come on, are you hearing me? This is God speaking to the people of Israel. He says, this is the kind of relationship I want to have with you. I want you to love me. I want you to honor me. I want you to serve me. I want you to worship me. I will even bless your food. I will even bless the water you drink. And then he goes on, he says, I will take away sickness from among you. I can give you half a dozen scriptures at least. In fact, I could give you a lot more just from the Old Testament where God says things like, and none of these diseases will come upon you. And he's saying that to Israel even after the fact that the world was already in a fallen state. Adam had already allowed the world to go out of control. And God's saying, Israel, I want to give you a future and I want my blessing to be over you in such a way that even your food and your water is blessed. I want to take away your sickness. I don't want you to have any sickness. And none of you will miscarry. And you won't be barren in your land. He says, not only do I want you to be fruitful in your womb, I even want your land to be fruitful. Wow. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand. And then he says, I will give you a full lifespan. The word of God never talks about God deliberately taking righteous people in the prime of life. In fact, God is so much for life that he, when he gives a command to honor your mother and father, he says, this is the first command that I actually attach a blessing to. And the blessing is that if you honor your mother and you honor your father, you will have a long life. It's not God who takes people in the prime of their life. If you look at God's mindset, he wants to live in relationship with us and he wants to bless us. How many of you think that's a good idea? What's really cool is when I started to read this verse, in uh, the NIV it says, worship the Lord your God. And I thought, you know, in today's context of the church, we think of worship as, you know, the songs that we sing with Pastor Steve and the band, and they do a great job, don't they? Absolutely, they do a great job. And we think of that as worship, and I thought, God, it says, worship the Lord your God and your blessing will be on our food and our water. Do you really just mean our praise and worship? And so I looked it up in the New King James Version and this is what it says. So you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. Sometimes we're sick because of the garbage that's in our food. Now, I'm not preaching on, you know, uh, I'm not going down that vein, but it is a reality. There's so much garbage in our food today, and we need to exercise self-control and eat better. But there's a promise here that when we're serving God, where we can't change our circumstances, God already has. He's the one who commands blessing on the food. Look, I grew up in a Christian home, and yes, my parents were pastors. We never had a meal without blessing it. You have the authority to bless food. If you don't pray before you eat, May I make a suggestion? Here's a promise that God says he will bless your food and bless your water. How about when you eat, you eat as a family and you all sit around the table, okay? Instead of everyone being fragmented. And then mom or dad, the leaders of the house, 
take hands with the kids and pray. God has given you the right to bless your food and even your water. I am not going to live under the fear of what's in my water or what's in my food. I will take wise precautions, but after that, I am not going to live like a paralytic. I am not going to live obsessed with fear. I am not going to have to alter my entire lifestyle and try to order my food so that it is perfect. There comes a point where I do my best and God does the rest. Let me encourage you, if you don't do this, when it's mealtime, sit down with your family. Gather your family together and pray over every meal and know that when you ask God to bless the food, that was his idea. He wants to even bless the food that's going to go into your body. You know, my grandfather believed this so much, and he understood God cares. And I remember when I was a little boy during the summer... Sometimes I would spend a week with grandma and grandpa at their house. They had a little country retreat out on Long Island. And I would spend a week or two with them. And grandpa would take his medication. And before he would take his medication, he prayed over it every time. And he said, Father, you bless this and let it do only good to my body. Now, I'm not advocating medication. I'm not advocating not taking medication. I am advocating, pray the blessing of God because God has already decreed it. Thank you, Russ. I appreciate that. But that's how much God wants to bless us. Israel comes from, can I have the scripture up there again? They come from this background that God had made a covenant that if they serve him, He would bless their bread, bless their water, take their sickness away. They wouldn't have miscarriages and the land wouldn't be barren for them. And he would give them a full life. And then Jesus comes on the show and he sees people helpless. He sees people harassed. And he's moved with compassion because God's people aren't living in the blessing that God intended. Can you understand why Jesus was moved with compassion? He sees people living less than God's destiny for their lives. And I'm telling you, the same is in the church. I'm preaching this today because I want you to know how abundant your God is. He wants to bless even the water you drink from the tap. If he's concerned about the water I drink, then he's concerned about a lot more regarding my life. Can I get an agreement? Jesus comes into an environment, Israel is filled with religious teachers, and yet people are broken, people are bound, people are sick, and they have no hope. And Jesus looks at the situation and says, these religious teachers are teaching them a heap of rules and regulations, and they're never showing the people God's heart. The letter of the law kills But the spirit of the law brings life. The spirit of the law is the heart of God. See, Jesus didn't heal because he could. He healed because he cares. Your little baby, he cares about your little baby. He cares. The same way you weep over your baby, you've heard things the doctors have said, you know, and at times it could get you, you know, a little bit perplexed, right? God cares about your baby. And he's moved as much as you are and even more so. You heard in my testimony about Zach and Emma. If you're watching my live stream, I know sometimes we separate the sermon from the worship. Go back to the worship and listen to the two miracles that we talked about today. But I was sitting here and I felt angry. I'm hearing about this baby Jackson. Didn't know it was their baby. And we're praying. I mean, I'm in church. And I'm feeling angry that this child has been touched with a curse. Now, I have a bit of experience. I know what that was. It wasn't my anger. I didn't know who Lisa was praying about. I thought, oh, she's praying for one of her friends who's got a baby named Jackson. 
Never put two and two together. Didn't know Jackson was having a problem. And I'm feeling angry. Look at me. Listen. Hear me. Believe me. God gets angry when the devil goes after you. God gets angry when the enemy starts putting his hands on you. God doesn't want you to be harassed. God doesn't want you to be a victim. Jesus died on the cross so that we could live like sons of God. Hallelujah. Was the son of God harassed? Was the son of God worried about cancer? Was the son of God growing tumors left, right, and center? No, but he came to break those curses God's intention for Israel was that they would live like this. Jesus comes and he sees the condition of the people and says, Oh, God help me. <laughs> these religious teachers have bound these people up. They're not even entering the kingdom of God. And they've got these people so confused, even these people are having trouble entering the kingdom of God. Look how harassed they are. Look how hopeless they are. They don't understand who they're meant to be. They don't understand that God wants his blessing, his covering to even be on the water they drink. They don't understand he wants their land to be prosperous. These people have lost the vision of what God intended from the moment of creation. And Jesus was moved. And that's why he did miracles. Because the news that the doctor gives you about your baby isn't the plan that God had from the beginning. And so God has moved. I felt angry for this little baby Jackson. I asked Lisa, who's Jackson? I'm angry. How dare the devil touch this kid? Now we pray for people on, in our morning prayer meetings, we pray for people all the time. In this moment, I feel the anger of God. And when they told me it was Zach and Emma, I said, come on, let's pray. And you heard, if you're watching by video and you're only seeing the sermon, watch the end of the praise and worship, and you'll hear the whole testimony. You'll hear Christopher's testimony. But what's my point? Listen, I don't want you coming to this church and thinking it's God's will for you to be miserable. I don't want you coming to this church and not hearing that God wants to make you the head and not the tail. I don't want you coming to this church and believe that God only heals the ones he wants and he doesn't always heal. I don't want you coming to this church and thinking, well, you got to just put up with all the garbage in life and you're just meant to be a punching bag. There is no way in the world my Bible teaches that and that is not God's concept of giving life and life more abundantly. You were bought with the blood. In the Old Testament, they put the blood over the doorpost and the devil had to run away. You are bought with the blood. You know what that means? It covers you, all of you. If the devil ran from the blood of a lamb, what will he do with the blood of Jesus Christ? You need to know who you are. You need to understand how important you are to God. How God really cares about everything in your life. Don't be sold a bill of goods by church. Oh, well, laying on of the hands isn't for today. Really? Bring that person to me because I want to lay hands on them. You show me in the Bible. There are some churches, they preach this all the time. No, laying on the hands isn't for today. Give me the scripture. Give me the chapter. Give me the book. I want to read it because I've been reading this book and teaching it all over the world. And I have yet to find where God says, okay, after Jesus resurrected, you're not supposed to lay hands on anyone anymore. You know, Jesus' brother, James, came to faith. James and his brothers ridiculed Jesus in the beginning. Study your Gospels, you'll see it. But he comes to faith and he becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem. And he writes a book by his name, the book of James. 
And James says, if any one of you is sick, call the elders of the church, and they will anoint you with oil. Now, back in those days, they didn't have spray bottles. They didn't spray you. They touched you with oil, and they anointed you. They didn't use a spray bottle. When I touch you with oil, I'm putting my hands on you. He said, let the elders anoint them with oil and pray over them because the prayer of the righteous availeth much. You know what that means? It does a hell of a lot of damage to the kingdom of darkness. There is power. When these prayers pray for you out the front, you better not be thinking, oh, I, I need Pastor Rob to touch me. Because that's doubt. Oh no, but I believe that you, Pastor Rob. No, it's doubt. The power is not me. The power is Jesus. Amen. And when any one of these prayers lay hands on you, you don't need Pastor Rob to lay hands on you. The Holy Spirit just touched you and Jesus is going to heal you. Can I get an amen? amen? I'm not asking you to follow me. I'm asking you to follow Jesus Christ. But these religious teachers who want to tell you laying on our hands isn't for today. And, uh, you know, God won't heal people because we pray for them. He'll only heal who he wants to. I have never heard a description of a more bigoted, obnoxious God than that. The God I serve loves everyone equally. He is no respecter of persons. And if he's going to heal one, he'll heal anyone who will trust him and believe him. Come on, let God know you believe that. And I'm glad this is on YouTube. I am tired of hearing garbage about God. God will heal, God will save, God will deliver. And if you don't believe so, give me a verse that says God wants you to stay sick and be miserable. If that's the case, then everything Jesus did was contrary to the will of God. The Bible says that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and he went around healing all who were under the power of the enemy and God was with him. Sounds like what Jesus did was in line with everything that was in God's heart because God was with him. It saddens me. What you're hearing coming out of me is this righteous indignation that was in me the other day. It saddens me that so many people in the church of Jesus Christ, and if you think this way in this church, I hope I'm changing your thinking. It saddens me that God picks and chooses who he wants to heal. No, God doesn't heal because he can and God doesn't heal because, oh, I want to heal her. God heals because he's moved with compassion. God heals because God cares. There isn't a mentally sound, stable parent who is normal in their logic and in their emotions who is thrilled and happy that they're chilled child is vexed with disease. And yet, we as humans who have the propensity to do stupid things and evil things and bad things, we will cry our heart out for the pain in our child, but then we'll turn around and say, well, that's God's will. God's teaching them something. God wants it. Really? Since when did fallen humanity have more compassion than the God of heaven and earth? It is an insult to the character of God to say that healing isn't for today. And I hope it blows up on YouTube. I really do. It is a diabolical lie to say that God doesn't love his people enough to want to heal every one of them. God loves you. The church is full of too much information where they, wrong information, where they're not sure whether or not they're on God's good side or God's bad side. 
I want you to know God only has one side and it's a good side and he's good all the time. He has come to give us life and life more abundantly. He has come to destroy the works of the evil one. John even says, this is why Jesus came, to destroy all the works of the evil one. Don't tell me that your arthritis or your cancer or your tumor or your migraines are God's blessing on your life. I listen to religious people tell me, well, God's being glorified. Because while they're miserable, they're still saying, thank you, Jesus. If your son came down with a rare disease that was going to shorten his life, and he only had three years left, and he kept a positive attitude, would you be thrilled in your heart and say, wow, I'm being glorified while he's dying? Have you ever sinned? Are you capable of sin? Have you ever said something stupid? Yes. Have you ever done something stupid? Oh, yes. You're just like me. <laughs> and yet you wouldn't want that for your son. If a doctor gave you a verdict like that, would you do everything within your monetary power, your mental power, your emotional power to find a solution for your son? Yes. I thought so. God is a lot better than you, and he's a lot better than me. Don't tell me God doesn't care. He cares. The blessing of God over the people of Israel wasn't evident in Israel. So what are we going to do? Let's be modern theologians like the church is full of today. Oh, well, the people aren't living under that blessing, so it can't be God's will. Let me tell you what God's will is. God's will is what's written, not what church leaders make up. Now, I didn't get a loud enough amen. amen. I told you, I got indignant the other day. I think it's still in me. God's will isn't what religious teachers tell you to make excuses why miracles aren't happening. God's will is what's written. You show me where Jesus turned to somebody and said, yeah, no, sorry, I healed her, but you're out of luck. You show me in the Bible where it says, well, when you go out for healing, remember, God doesn't heal everyone. If you haven't been healed, don't give up. If you haven't been healed, change your picture of God. If you haven't been healed, start to understand God is moved with compassion for you and your condition. And he hurts for you. That's why Jesus went to the cross to take all the hurt and to break the, the curse. Amen. Amen. Am I getting to anybody? And, and I'm not trying to tell anyone off. Not at all, please don't take it that way. But there's an indignation in my heart that the devil does his crap. Yeah, I said it. And then we want to say, well, that's God's will. God loves you. Wants to set you free. God cares about you. He wants to heal you. While I might learn something through my sickness, God has got to be a poor teacher if he's going to give me cancer to teach me something. How many of you would come here to church if every Sunday my method of teaching you was vexing you with some kind of incurable disease so that as you go through the misery of that, your character will grow, and hopefully you'll learn to have a positive attitude. How many of you would come back next week? <laughs> then why do we do this stupid stuff with God? Why do we let preachers tell us stupid stuff like this and say, well, that's how God works? That's not how God works. That's how the devil works. He does his stuff and then he points at God. Here, let's all be real. How many of you ever, when you were a little kid, 
did something wrong, and when your mother or father found out, you pointed at your brother or your sister. Put your hand up. Come on. Confession is good for the soul. Put your hand up. We've all done it. And what do you think the devil does? What you did was a lie, and it was worse than a lie because you are transferring the blame onto an innocent person. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from a spirit of darkness. It works in us as children. We don't want to take the heat. We'll pass the blame to someone else, and they're totally innocent. What do you think the devil does? He messes up people's lives and then he gets religious teachers like Jesus was fed up with who stand up in the church and say, well, it's for God's glory. I'm going to tell you what's for God's glory. When this guy's traveling at 89 miles an hour and should have been killed and he goes flying off a bike and he doesn't die, his heel is all mashed up and they got to do surgery, he gets touched and in one moment takes off the boot, walking around with no pain and then gets an x-ray that it's as if he never had an injury. I think that gives glory to God. We're having a healing service next Sunday. And people are going to be healed. Bring your sick friends. Bring your sick relatives. Bring the unsaved. Signs and wonders were used in the gospel to help people believe. They see miracles and they believe. Ebony, what happened in your heart when you saw your husband get up and walk down the front? And that's with a boot on his foot. You know how bad it was. What did it do to your heart when you saw him walking down here? It did enough to make you fall to your knees and weep. Is that what you did? You fell to your knees right here. I was watching you. You were in awe. He takes his boot off and then walks around the church. That's what gives glory to God. Amen. Jesus was moved with compassion. Now let me show you something. I'm going to close with this here. Can we go back to Exodus 25 or whatever it was, 23? When you read this in the Hebrew, that word worship, in the New King James it says, you shall serve the Lord. Let's go to the New King James. You shall serve the Lord. Let's go to the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is abad. Abad. To work, to serve, to be a bondservant. Let me talk to the modern day American church. Online and in this building. Everyone look at me. Online, stay tuned, listen to me. God says, if you serve me, if you become a bond servant, what's he talking about? God is always God. When we live for ourselves, we've created another God. Christianity today has been preached in such a way where God loves us so much, he's happy to just be a little add-on to our lives. And so we presented a gospel where we get saved, we ask Jesus in our heart, he's tucked away somewhere, he's an add-on to my life, now I'm going to live my life and God's going to bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. No, God says, serve me. Let your life revolve around me. I am God. Worship me. Work for me. Serve me. Be a bondservant to me. Because when you do, you are entering into divine order. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and then God's children. This is divine order. You have to serve God. Not just sing songs. Not just show up once a month. Even showing up four months. You could come, you could come every day, every Sunday of the month. Are you living for him? Is your life being built around God or is God an add-on to your life? Come on. I may not say what you want to hear right now, but I'm saying it so tough. I'm going to say what the word of God says. 
You're not the boss. I'm not the boss. You're not in control. I'm not in control. You're not God. I'm not God. He's God. And we have to serve him. That's the Hebrew word, not Pastor Rob's word. Serve him, abad, to work, to serve, to be a bond servant. Your life needs to, God needs to be the center of your life and your life surrounds him. And God says, when you come back into divine order where I'm the head and your life is being built around me, you come under my divine canopy, my covering, divine order will cover you, and that's why your food will be blessed, your water will be blessed. Sickness and disease will have to leave you. Your womb will not have miscarriages, and your land will not be barren. Let's go back to Genesis. While Adam and Eve were in the garden, God was in the garden with them, and everything was perfect. And the moment Adam decided to do something that God said no, he stopped letting God be the head, and instead of revolving his life around God's, he decided to go his own way. And that was the beginning of the greatest tragedy of human history. And everything has gone wrong ever since. And so when God said that in Exodus 23, he was calling the people of Israel, come on, let's get back into divine order. I, I've got to be number one in your life. Amen. And we don't hear this preached enough in church. We preach only the fact that God wants to bless you. Yeah, God wants to bless you, but the preacher is going to tell you what the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't tell the people of Israel. God must be first in our lives. And when God is first in our lives, we are living under the flow and the benefit of divine order. Everybody say, I want divine order in my life. See, God created us to honor him and to serve him, and he will bless us. Now, God's not saying, hear me, hear me. God's not saying, I want you to serve me, and if you don't, I'm going to spit on you, throw rocks on you, and I'm going to give you tumors and cancers. No, what God is saying is this, hear me. In fact, you need to write this down. Live under the flow of my divine order. Because when you step out of my divine order, you step into demonic disorder. God's not trying to manipulate us and say, well, if you don't serve me, I'm going to fry your chips. No. What God is saying, hey, I want to give you a key to life. I want to give you a key to wisdom. Serve me. Let your life be about who I am. Stop trying to drag me into your life so that I'm the little magic button. Bless me, bless me, bless me. You won't even need to pray for blessing. If you get back into divine order like Adam and Eve were before they stepped out of divine order, this is what will be normal. Your food will be blessed. Your water will be blessed. Diseases won't take you down. Your womb won't give up its child prematurely. Your land will be fruitful, and you will live and have long lives. Put it on the screen. When we live outside of God's divine order, we fall into demonic disorder. God doesn't want that to happen. God's not being spiteful. Serve me or I'll curse you. No. God's being wise. He's saying, sweetheart, because the devil rules this world, thanks to the first Adam, serve me. Get back in a divine order because when I'm first in your life, you are under a covering of protection. Plead the blood. And the devil will have to flee. But if you just want me to be a tag along, you wear me like a lucky charm, and you're not making your life about me. You see, when we make our lives about God, God will make his life about us. God's saying, if you step out of this flow, this atmosphere, 
this divine order, unfortunately, when you step out of my divine order, there's a demon ready to suck you up into demonic disorder. At the moment, the God of this world is Satan. That will never be, that will not remain the case, but it is at the moment. And the moment we get out of divine order, there's a demon waiting. He's waiting to pee on us. He's waiting to throw up on us. He's willing, waiting to throw all of his garbage on us. And Jesus was moved with compassion because the people didn't understand the principles of God. We want to go to church and be in and out from beginning to end in 60 minutes. I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot go this deep in 60 minutes. You might be able to watch world news in 60 minutes, but you don't do God in 60 minutes. No apologies here. I'm not going to raise up a people that think God's going to be thrilled because we can barely fit them in on a Sunday. Did you ever read This is the Lord's Day? Come on. Yeah. Hear me clearly. God wants to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. But you've got to get into divine order like it was before the fall. God first. Live your life. I said it two weeks ago. Whatever your profession is, that doesn't define you. That's your camouflage. That's your disguise. You're meant to be incognito. You are in the world but not part of the world. You're a doctor but in that place you're bringing the light of Jesus Christ and God is relying on you to touch people in the medical scene. You can share the testimony of your sister. You can share the testimony of your nephew over here. They only understand science. You can say, look, I get the science, but these are the facts. Look at this. There is a God. He does amazing things. Every one of you who go to work, that doesn't define who you are. Son of God, child of God is what defines who you are. Your vocation is a disguise. It is your camouflage to fit in. But you are meant to be in that place as an agent and a representative of the Most High. And you are there to be the salt and to be the light. And if you're not the salt and you're not the light, they will be darkness to you and they will lead you astray. Too quiet. I have a word for you. I was here early this morning, Sterling, and God told me that he gave you the gift to make money. You have a wisdom that comes natural to you, and it's not natural to other people. But God told me very clearly, what you have done in your natural ability God, God will outdo in his supernatural ability if you serve him. There's a key there. If you serve him, you will laugh at the money you've seen so far because God will bless you even more than you've ever known. The covenant God made with his people is not to sing happy songs. It's not to come to church even every Sunday. It's to build your life around him. I make no apology. If anyone wants to write me a, a, a nasty email, have at it. I make no apology. God has to be number one in our lives. He's God. We are not. At 65 years old, as a pastor, I can testify to you and tell you everything I did in my will and everything I did my way, I regret. I've screwed up. All of my biggest mistakes came from me. And my best moments are when I surrender to him and say, God, not what I want, but whatever you want, your will be done. Amen. Come on, let's stand. Yes, we went longer today. Yes, we had prayer time. I don't apologize. Look, look at me. Look at me. 
online, listen to me. Jesus saw the people and said they look like sheep without shepherds. And then, I didn't read this verse. One of the verses in my sermon was, he sat down and he started to teach them. If someone doesn't tell you the truth, the devil will tell you a lie. I don't apologize for my preaching. I know that I preach the truth. You don't pay me. You don't pay me. You don't pay me. Oh, but we tithe. Let me tell you. God knows how to bring money in without your tithe. You don't pay me. I am employed by God and I have to tell the truth. I am not here to run a Mickey Mouse club or to run a club for Rob Scarallo. This is not called Rob Scarallo Ministries. It's not my name. It's his name that we honor. And it's him that we serve. And in this house, I'm going to lay it out the way it is, not because I'm an angry preacher. No, I'm going to lay it out because the truth will set us free. We need to build our lives around his life. Don't expect him to be the little tag along on your shoulder that you only remember when you need help. No. God has promised, make me the center and the reason for your living and you will be in divine order. And I'm telling you, even your water will be blessed. Your bread will be blessed. Your meat will be blessed. Your land will be blessed. Your marriage will be blessed. Thus said the Lord. God said it. We are living in the last days. You can't afford to play Christianity anymore. How many of you here have recognized that there's a lot of craziness happening in the world? Come on. There's a lot of craziness happening. You never would have thought this 10 years ago. Okay? It's coming faster and faster. The church of Jesus Christ needs to wake up. The bridegroom's going to come back and they're going to be Christians and their oil jars are going to be empty. Five wise virgins, five foolish virgins. Come on, church. Let's build our lives around him. We live for him and we live with him and we let him live through us. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Every eye closed. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, this is where it starts. Asking Jesus into your life is coming to a place where you realize, okay, life is bigger than me, and life isn't just about me. There is a God, and he wants to help me. He wants to live with me, and he wants to bless me. But I need to acknowledge him and allow him to come into my life. We do that by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. You don't do it by going to a Catholic church, Methodist church, Baptist church, or Grace and Faith church. That won't do it. You have to say, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. And I want you to live inside me. Forgive me of all my mistakes. I'm surrendering to you. I want to build my life around you. Now, if you've never asked Jesus in your heart, every eye closed, and you want to do that this morning, come on, put your hand up right now. Put your hand up and say, I want to accept Jesus. He loves you. No one will love you more than Jesus right across this auditorium. Maybe you've walked away from God. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't say, oh, well, what if someone sees me? God wants to see you. I, say, I think I see a hand raised. All right? I'm going to take that as a raised hand. Thank you, young lady. I see that hand. You can put it down. God bless you. Yeah? Okay. Who else wants to say yes to Jesus? This is awesome. We had someone accept Christ this morning as well, which is a fantastic thing. I want those that raise their hand and everyone in this church, repeat after me. We're going to ask Jesus to come in our heart. 
Dear God, I believe you care. You hear me because you care. You feel what I feel because you care. I want to know you. I'm asking you, Jesus Christ, to come into my heart today, right now. I've messed up. We've all messed up. Forgive me of all my mistakes and sin. Jesus Christ, I want you in my heart. Forgive me of my sin. And from this day forward, I give you my life. Live in me, live with me, and live through me. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Amen. Hey, church, both services, people have given their lives to Jesus. What do you say to that? Amen. And to those of you that are born again, do yourself the favor and ask yourself, is Jesus just a tag on? Or are you building your life around him? Are you working for him? Are you serving him? Are you honoring him as God? There can only be one God, and it's not us. It's him. As we serve him and work for him and build our lives around him, God will build his divine order around your life, and you will be amazed of the power and the authority that you will start to understand and live in because of Jesus Christ. Now, before you leave, hug half a dozen people. Come on. Greet each other. Rub shoulders with each other. Smell someone's breath. All right? Bless them. Amen. <laughs>